Well, today's lecture is going to feature some of the things out of chapter eight that are going to help you in two areas. First of all, we're going to talk about solubility. What we're also going to do is talk about electrolysis and electrolytic behavior, which is at the heart of next week's lab. Now, also at the heart of next week's lab are net and total ionic equations, which will be the subject of Wednesday's lecture, um, which is one of the reasons I've encouraged your lab professors to uh, be a little bit more lenient toward the submission of that pre-lab for next week's lab because it's a concept that we haven't quite touched on yet. Um, but before we can get to that spot, we're gonna have to step back for a second and go back to one of our definitions. When we first started talking about phases of matter and reactions, the term aqueous came up in that conversation. We see aqueous come up in certain types of chemical equations where if you see that phase AQ, what we're talking about is something that has been dissolved in water. That's what an aqueous solution is. We took some sort of chemical substance, we dissolved it in water, and we use that substance in that format as part of the reacting species. Now, <clears throat> aqueous solutions can come in a variety of different forms. Primarily, we can put them into two different categories. The first category are electrolytes. These are solutions, substances that when dissolved in water will conduct electricity. And then there are non-electrolytes, substances that when we dissolve them in water do not conduct electricity. So one of the great marketing schemes out there is for Gatorade, Powerade, and all the other sports beverages, talking about how you need to replenish your electrolytes pretty much anytime you do anything as strenuous as walking across the lawn. And all that they are selling to you is flavored salt water. That's essentially what it is. An electrolyte, the electrolytes in Gatorade and Powerade and all the others, they're variants of sodium and potassium and magnesium and some other kinds of salts that they then put sugar and flavoring agents and coloring agents in them to make them taste not so salty. But that's all that they are. And you really don't need to replace your electrolytes unless you're doing some strenuous exercise that requires a lot of sweating to go on. But nonetheless, they're always there and you just, it's always an option. And some people like the taste of it and that, that helps them too. But as far as a health beverage is concerned, it's not that great. Um, matches up pretty close to the amount of sugar in sodas and other things that we're, set, we're supposed to be avoiding for health reasons anyway. So let's talk about electrolytes. Again, an electrolyte solution is a solution that's capable of conducting electricity. And more often than not, those electrolytic solutions fall into this category. Ionic compounds, AKA salts, being dissolved in water. Now, in addition to those, we also see that acids and bases are capable of having electrolytic power. However, their electrolytic capability is variable. and varies based on the strength of the acid or base in question. Now, where does this conductance come from? Where it comes from is 
when that substance dissolves in water, we're going to see something happen. We're going to see that the water molecules are going to pull that, that molecule apart. And as they're pulling that molecule apart, we're going to get charged particles as a result. You need charged particles in motion to conduct electricity. Electricity is just the movement of electrons from one area to another. In copper wire, that movement of electrons is easily transmitted through that wire because metals with that sea of electrons have plenty of electrons available to just move along with it. Ionic compounds and electrolytes are able to conduct electricity because as those electrons are moving through, the presence of those ions in solution stabilize the electrical conductance and allow it to move on because there are other charged particles present there to kind of help it along. In substances that are not electrolytic, we don't have those charged particles. And as a result, when that electricity goes down into the liquid, there's no charge there to stabilize it. And so it just kind of stops dead and cold. So for electrolytic character, we're looking for ions. Now, in terms of electrolytic character, again, we can split it into two different ways. There are strong electrolytes. These are substances that conduct electricity very, very well. And then there are weak electrolytes that do it, obviously, more poorly. The difference between them is what we call dissociation. So we know that the water is going to pull apart the molecules. The question is how much? In strong electrolytes, water is able to pull it apart completely, and we've got lots of positive and lots of negative ions present. And so ionic compounds are really good about this. We saw in chapter six, you know, those drawings that we made on Monday where we had the positive ion and the negative ion. And by the way, thanks for listening on that one. It was really nice to read those essays and, uh, and see that most of you knew what you were talking about. Uh, because that's not always, that hasn't been historically the case. Historically, the case has been, oh, I don't know. They just, they just exist. Um, so it was, it was nice to see that our review caught on for a number of you. Um, and most of you were able to get that question right, as opposed to leaving it blank or giving a very, very generic and incorrect answer. But anyway, we know that water molecules are able to completely separate those ions, break it apart completely, surround the cations with the negative pole, surround the anions with the positive pole. We get complete dissociation as a result. Every sodium chloride molecule turns into a sodium ion and a chloride ion. With weak electrolytes, what we see is something called partial dissociation. And this is really common among acids and bases, weak acids and weak bases in particular where we have a polar molecule. Acetic acid is a polar molecule, but we aren't able to always pull it apart into ions. We can separate the acetic acid molecules from each other. We can create more hydrogen bonding between acetic acid and water, acetic acid and acetic acid, water and water. But to pull apart that OH bond, to get it to be H plus and acetate ion, that's a little bit more difficult. Only happens about 5% of the time. The other 95% stays in this molecular form like this. So we do have ions and it will conduct electricity, but there's a very noticeable difference between the two. And you're going to see that full force in action 
in that lab next week. So again, what kinds of materials am I looking for if I'm gonna try to classify strong versus weak based purely on formula? And the answers here are relatively simple. If I have a soluble ionic compound, it's gonna be a strong electrolyte. Important note here, even if the substance is relatively insoluble, small amounts of it will dissolve. And when that small amount does dissolve, it's gonna completely dissociate. So the question for its electrolytic character is how can we get the most of it to dissolve as much as possible? Do we have to play with temperature conditions? Do we have to play with uh, pH conditions? What are some things that we can do to try to get that substance to dissolve a little bit more? So it can be a little bit tricky in that regard, but if we say that we have an ionic compound that is soluble in aqueous solution, then we should assume that it is a strong electrolyte. Also in this category of strong electrolytes are our strong bases. Strong bases dissociate completely. So bases like sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, better known as lye and potash, uh, caustic soda. Those are all strong bases. They all uh, should dissociate completely. Strong acids. Things like hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, nitric acid. These dissolve and dissociate completely as well. Your weak electrolytes, the only things here are your weak acids and bases. And your weak acids and bases, what we see there is more of an equilibrium kind of setting where we've got the molecularized version and the ionized version kind of going in this back and forth between each other. And on the average, on the average, we see somewhere between 10% ionization or less where it falls on that particular scale has everything to do with its concentration and what it is. Some things just dissolve and dissociate better than others. For those of you that take Chem 106 in the spring, you'll get a big heaping dose of this particular reality, um, probably somewhere in and around March. Um, but we'll, we'll kind of leave it at this part right now, right here. So that's electrolytic behavior. What about non-electrolytic behavior? Non-electrolytic behavior occurs when we have substances that do not produce ions. So this is usually things that are molecular, covalent in nature, things like alcohols, sugars, biomolecules, and so on. Organic materials fall into this category as well. Pure water falls into this category. Because pure water, even though it is polar, pure water does not dissociate into ionic substances, at least not very well. It does technically, but the concentrations of those substances are on the order of 10 to the negative seven which is essentially nothing. Certainly not enough to conduct any kind of electricity. What we also see is that solid materials fall into this category as well. Even though I have charged particles in an ionic crystal like sodium chloride, those charged particles are incapable of moving. And so they can't stabilize the moving current of the electrons in the electrical, uh, in 
our electricity. So the two conditions for electrical conductivity are you have to have charged particles to stabilize those electrons, and you have to have the ability for those charged particles to move. An ionic compound meets the first condition, but it does not meet the second. To meet both conditions, our ionic compound either has to be dissolved in water or it has to be in the liquid phase. You have to melt it. And melting it gives it that liquidous property that allows those ions to move freely. So, now that we've kind of established the concept of electrolytic character, and we've put our molecules, our substances into three categories. There are the molecular substances that do not conduct. There are the strong electrolytes that conduct very, very well. And then there are the weak electrolytes that fall into that kind of cross phase between the two where I've got molecular compounds for the most part, but they are capable of ionizing at least partially. And that's where we get weak acids and weak bases. Molecular compounds that are capable of ionizing to some degree, but not completely in water. So what about the ionic compounds? Like I said, if it dissolves in water, we know it's going to conduct electricity quite well, but we know from experience that not all ionic compounds dissolve in water. How do we determine whether an ionic compound is soluble in water or insoluble in water? And that's where solubility rules come in. Solubility rules are guidelines. They tell us, generally speaking, how an ionic substance should react in water. And based upon those guidelines, we can make some informed decisions about what we would expect that substance to do. Now, the solubility rules come in three different kinds of layers. The first layer, there are a group of ions that we can identify that will always produce soluble salts. There is a second group. We will call that group the usually solubles. These are ions that when we see them, they usually create soluble substances but there is a limited group of exceptions that apply. And then the third group is the mostly insoluble group. And then the mostly insoluble group we can't say that they are definitively insoluble because they will often pair with substances that are in the first group. But the majority of the exceptions that exist are in that first group. Now, in this, these three classification systems are hierarchical, meaning the first supersedes the second, which supersedes the third. Now, second and third don't have a whole lot of crossover. But if I have anything that's in group one, I know it's going to be soluble. I can end the conversation right there. Doesn't matter what it's attached to. It's got that ion on it. I expect it to dissolve in water. The other two, we've got to be a little bit more careful with exceptions. But again, the third group, most of the exceptions are the first group anyway. So if we're following the hierarchy, we have already classified them as soluble anyway. Let's take a look at what is in each of those groups. <clears throat> 
So this is group number one. Group number one, the ions that are always soluble, These include nitrates, acetates, chlorates and perchlorates, but not chlorites. And on the cation side, your alkali metal ions and your ammonium ion. So if you've ever wondered why so many of the chemicals that we give you are sodium salts, or nitrate salts. This is the reason why. We can dissolve them into water real easy. Don't have to worry about it. Don't have to worry about exceptions. Don't have to worry about limited solubility characteristics. These substances dissolve in water and usually dissolve in water quite well. So again, nitrates, acetates, Chlorates and perchlorites, that's the anion side. Most of our solubility rules are anion rules. And then on the flip side, we've got your cations from group one and your ammonium ion. So that's my always soluble group. Let's take a look at our second group. These are the substances that are usually soluble. Sulfide, or excuse me, usually insoluble. I must have skipped one somewhere there, I apologize. In the usually soluble group, we've got your halide ions with the exception of fluoride. So this is the chlorine, the bromine, and the iodine. Chloride, bromide, iodine. These are usually soluble in water and we have many evidences of these kinds of compounds. Sodium chloride, iron three chloride, potassium chloride, Magnesium chloride, barium chloride. Not so much with the bromides and the iodides, but those, that's more because of those ones tend to be a little bit more expensive to acquire. What are our exceptions? Our silver compounds, our mercury compounds, and our lead compounds. Back in the golden age of chemistry, all the way back in the year 2000, when I was a sophomore student in Mr. Rich Samsa's chemistry class in high school, he presented me with, well, all of us, with a series of mnemonic devices to help us with this. And for whatever reason, this one has always stuck with me. Merle's chlorides. These are the insoluble exceptions. Mer for mercury, L for lead, S for silver. Merle's chlorides. Don't know why it's stuck with me 20 years later, but it always has. So, If I see one of Merle's chlorides, I know that it's not going to dissolve in water. 
Sulfates have a similar group of exceptions. Now, most of the exceptions surrounding the sulfates are in the lower part of group two, your barium, your calcium, your strontium. But we see also here, look at a little bit of a commonality. Mercury one and lead are in both of these groups. Mercury one and lead, we can think of those ions in particular as being generally insoluble in water. They're not gonna be on your insolubles list. Our insolubles list focuses mainly on anions. But something to kind of log in the back of your head is that those two ions in particular, and silver is actually pretty good at this as well, it just isn't on the sulfates list. They tend to form a lot of insoluble compounds. Now, going back to my dear friend, Mr. Samsa, taking us back 20 years to when I was a chemistry student as well. He had a mnemonic for this one as well. It's in the same kind of vein. It's a little bit more tortured of a learning device, but it, it still can work. Alchemer sulfates, Ba for barium, L for lead, Ca for calcium, Mer for mercury, and S for strontium. Alchemer sulfates are insoluble. So again, if I see one of Alchemer sulfates, I know that it's going to stay insoluble. If I don't see one of Alchemer sulfates, then I know that that sulfate's going to dissolve in water. So that's my usually soluble list. That's my usually soluble list. My usually insoluble list pretty much includes every other anion that you can think of. So we've talked about acetates, nitrates, chlorates and perchlorates. That was in the always group. We talked about sulfates and halides. That was in the usually soluble group. If it's not one of those groups, if it's not one of those six or seven ions, then it's gonna be in this group, the usually soluble. And the usually soluble group consists, again, primarily of things that we've already seen. So what are the exceptions for sulfides? In the sulfides group, everything on that list is in the always soluble pile with the exception of the alkaline earth metals. So yes, magnesium sulfide, calcium sulfide, barium sulfide, these substances tend to stay dissolved in water. Same thing with the hydroxides. Now with the hydroxides, it get gets a little bit more complicated than this. We get into a category of hydroxides called sparingly soluble, meaning that some of it does dissolve, but a lot of it doesn't. Uh, magnesium hydroxide, beryllium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide to a large degree. These substances have a hard time getting dissolved. Their solubility points are relatively low, right around 0.1 molar in a lot of cases. 
but we put them into this category as exceptions because we do see marginal solubility with them. Now, as far as your solubility rules, proficiencies and whatnot go, hydroxides are bases. So as far as that characterization goes, we would identify a hydroxide in our solubility rules proficiency as a base, and we would classify it as strong or weak based upon you know, what characteristics it has. We wouldn't be evaluating its solubility in that case as a soluble salt or an insoluble salt. We would identify it as a base because that's the more important feature of it is its ability to impact pH. Everything else on this list, and including the things that are not on this list. So here we've got carbonates, we've got phosphates, we've got oxalates, we've got chromates and dichromates. We can also throw into here things like sulfites, phosphites, bicarbonates, bisulfates, pretty much anything else that you can think of that is not on this list, thiosulfates, if it's not on this list, it's just because this is not an exhaustive list. Anything that wasn't mentioned before belongs on this list. So again, if it's not an acetate, it's not a nitrate, it's not a um, chlorate or a perchlorate, it's not a halogen ion, it's not a sulfate, it belongs on this list. it's gonna be usually insoluble, unless it is paired up with the ammonium ion, which was on the always soluble list, an alkaline metal ion, which was on the always soluble list. Those would be your exceptions. So with this in mind, we now have the ability to categorize ionic compounds based upon their formulas. And moreover, this gives us the power to do something that we really only glossed over before. We talked about the idea of double replacement reactions and how in a double replacement reaction, the substances, the ions, switch places with each other. Knowledge of solubility rules will actually let us know whether or not that means anything. Because there are some kinds of double replacement reactions that exist where the switching of the ions just means that they go from one solution to another. And to that end, nothing tangibly changed. I had two solutions before, now I have one bigger solution after. All the ions that were present before are present now. Did a chemical reaction actually happen in that case? Well, the answer there would be no. Because in order for a chemical reaction to take place, you have to have a chemical change. If all of the substances present there are present as reactants and products, then we saw nothing happen. All we did was we made a solution. That's not a chemical change, that's a physical one. And that gets us into, that's our topic for Wednesday. Before we get to that spot, let's talk a little bit more about solution formation. Now we've alluded to this again, chapter six, um, which doesn't seem that long ago, especially since we just took the quiz over it. Chapter six, we kind of highlighted this. Let's talk about it a little bit more formally. We know that in a solution, those solute particles are evenly distributed, dispersed throughout that solution. What we really haven't talked about is how we got to that spot. How do we get to the part where we take those solute particles that were all clustered together, 
in a mass of, of salt or solid of some kind and gets them to the point where they are all dispersed evenly throughout this liquid medium. Again, we haven't really talked about that. What we have talked about are the intermolecular forces. We know that in order for the solution to form, we have to be able to have greater forces after the interaction than we did before. We talked about that idea on Monday of how those intermolecular forces in water will essentially squeeze out oil because the forces inside of the water are so much stronger than the forces that the water would make with the oil. So the water bands together, squeezes out the nonpolar molecules, and that's the end of it. Can't get them to go together. So we know that we need to have greater levels of attraction. The solute and solvent have to be a better fit with each other than they are with themselves. And so what literally happens is that when the water encounters, so imagine for a second, I'm just gonna put a box around it here. This was our mass of crystal. This was our ionic compound. And what happens is that the water molecules start to swarm into the crystal and start to pick off the pieces. Again, aligning themselves according to their polarities. The negative on the oxygens starts to pull apart the positive cations, the positive on the hydrogens, starts to pull off the negative ions in the anions. And so as they are interacting with each other, we are seeing that more and more of these ions are starting to pick off of the crystal and get surrounded by these water molecules. Now, it doesn't just stop there. Keep in mind, all molecules are in motion at all times. So over time, the water molecules are going to be moving randomly throughout that medium. And eventually, we would get to a spot where they would all evenly distribute themselves throughout the entire solution. This is something that we could prove to ourselves if you went home and took a coffee cup or some kind of glass container, filled it up with water, and then just put a spoonful of salt or sugar or whatever you got around in it, what you would find is that if you let it sit there long enough, eventually that pile of salt in the bottom would disappear without you ever stirring it once. Why is that? The random motion of the water would eventually dissolve away all of those ions in that crystal. Now, of course, that would be the slowest way possible to do it, but we could do it. The more obvious thing is that, you know, we heat up the water, which would increase the molecular motion, or we stir it, which would increase the surface area that's available and get more water molecules to interact with more ions at the same time, all of those things would occur and allow the dissolving process to happen more rapidly. But again, as we saw, this will happen on its own. The water molecules through their random motion will surround those ions and start picking them off of the crystal. And given enough time, they would do it completely on their own. It would just take some time to do. So the question that we are going to leave out for um, over this weekend and coming into Wednesday's lecture is something that I alluded to just a few minutes ago. How do we know 
that a reaction has actually occurred inside of aqueous solution. So I put, I have one aqueous solution and a second aqueous solution. I dump them together. How do I know that anything happened? The answer to that question lies in the chemical reactions themselves. So if I pull out balanced chemical equations and track reactants and products throughout, I would get an idea of what has actually occurred. And the two most common types of reactions that we would encounter are what are called precipitation reactions. These are reactions that form a solid. And acid-base reactions, these are reactions that usually produce water and a salt. And so those are the things that I would be looking for in my products. Do I have something in the products that is insoluble? Do I have something in the products that represents water and salt? Is there a tangible, noticeable difference between my reactants and products? And the only way to really get after that is to do what we call ionic equations. And ionic equations will be the subject of our time on Wednesday. So in the meantime, happy hunting as far as getting the studying ready. Um, Monday, again, same rules as before, seven to seven available, up in grade scope by 10. Have a good weekend. Good luck on the exam. I'll see you on Wednesday.